Hello, everyone. I'm Katrina Kelly, and I'm a senior research fellow in Russian and Soviet culture at Trinity. And I'm delighted and honoured to welcome Sheila Fitzpatrick, the renowned historian of Russia and the Soviet Union, for today's lecture. At present, Sheila is a visiting fellow commoner at Trinity College, and so we thank the college for that support and her sponsor and the organiser of today's talk, who is Professor Emma Widdis, who's sitting here in the audience. Sheila has, I hardly need to tell you, but I hate that locution, who needs no introduction. It always strikes me as what Russians call unceremonious, which means rude, actually. Um, <laughs> she's had a long academic career of immense distinction. Um, as of now, she's professor at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne and honorary professor at the University of Sydney. She is also Bernadotte E. Schmidt Distinguished Service Professor Emerita of Modern Russian History at the University of Chicago. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Australian Academy of the Humanities, the holder in 2002 of a Distinguished Achievement Award from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the winner of the Marguerite Medal for Biography for My Father's Daughter, Memoirs of an Australian Childhood. She's also written a splendid memoir of her early visits to the USSR, as many people will know, A Spy in the Archives, and a memoir of her late husband, Mishka's War. Sheila's many books in the field of Soviet history include, to cite just a few, The Commissariat of Enlightenment, Soviet Organization of Education and the Arts under Lunacharsky, which is a pioneering Western study using archival resources, Stalin's Peasants on the Aftermath of Collectivization, Everyday Stalinism, on Stalin's team, uh, White Russians Red Peril, a Cold War history of migration to Australia, which came out in 2021. Um, and of course, the book she's here to talk about today, which I'll come to in a second. She's published landmark articles on cultural transformation in the late 20s and early 1930s on the institutional history of Soviet bureaucracies, on social mobility in the Stalin era, just to name a few things where she's just a leading figure um, and extremely influential. She's acted as what in German is called the Doktor Mutter to several generations of younger historians, many of whom are now themselves academic stars. Through all of this, she has remained very much her own person and espoused neither the enlightened bureaucrat model of academic life nor still less the efficient manager one. Sheila is here today to introduce her latest book, a concise, lucid, and thought-provoking history of the USSR that begins with a year when everything seemed to be going well, 1980. The sense of unpredictable twists in Soviet and more broadly Russian history is refreshing at a point when some other historians have fallen back on long-term explanations for the state of things now, such as anxiety about the external enemy, a sense of messianic destiny, and so on. As Sheila's book shows, characteristic of, characteristics of this kind can change very quickly. I appreciated the book also for its attention to social, economic, and cultural factors, as well as political history, for its shrewd and unexpected insights, and for its attention to late Soviet history, which often gets presented as a tedious interlude between Stalin and Gorbachev. Vital also is Sheila's capacity to project an understanding of why the USSR survived, as well as, well as why it collapsed, as she writes of the Brezhnev era before economic stagnation set in at the end of the 1970s, if the economists had been trying to measure happiness at work instead of labor productivity, they might have come up with better results. This sits alongside a compassionate understanding of the catastrophic experiences that Soviet citizens endured over the country's seven and a half decades of existence, revolution, civil war, collectivization, famine, political terror, world war, and finally a surge of exhilaration accompanied by panic as the entire architecture of the federal USSR collapsed after the abortive and farcical attempted coup of August 1991. With that, I hand over to Sheila herself for Soviet history as black comedy, shortest history of the Soviet Union. So please join me in welcoming Sheila Fitzpatrick. Okay. Now, black comedy. I'm not sure that black comedy is a genre in history, uh, as against in literature and theater. But as I wrote the shortest history of the Soviet Union, I was aware of a strong pull in that direction. To be sure, I resisted to some degree, so that in the book I actually wrote, the black comedy stream tends to be quietly bubbling below a more conventional narrative that tries to cover a lot of ground as clearly and fairly as possible. But I thought, I thought I'd take the opportunity of this talk 
uh, to reflect on that black comedy pool. I don't think that I would have felt it if I were writing a history of, uh, say, Tudor England or 19th century Australia. And when I stopped to think, would I, if I were writing about the French Revolution, would black comedy be a genre that came to mind? And I think definitely not, uh, which is itself quite a, a, interesting to examine why that might be. Now, perhaps uh, there, there are other subjects that, that, that uh, might provoke the black, black comedy theme, for example, Trump's America. Uh, but in general, uh, the pull towards black comedy, uh, for me, is Soviet-specific, uh, and perhaps to a lesser degree, Russia-specific. Uh, so what's all this about? Black is not the only color one can use for the history of the Soviet Union. But blackness, that is to say, state terror, disruption, hardship, repression, was certainly present. So present and, uh, uh, and frequently present in, in many different manifestations. Uh, so that, you know, it sometimes feels like lurching from one disaster to another when one, one writes that history. So given that, what are the genre uh, that a historian can use? Well, one of them, and quite a popular one, is savage indignation, j'accuse. In other words, I am the prosecutor of all the, uh, the crimes that were committed. Uh, one can write it as tragedy. Uh, for example, that there was some fatal flaw uh, that led uh, to terrible outcomes, uh, that being often uh, uh, understood as a flaw in Marxist or Marxist-Leninist ideology. Uh, that was the totalitarian theorist's uh, take on it. Uh, so a flaw that leads uh, inexorably uh, to disaster. Uh, one can have the genre of melodrama, the good guys against the, the, the bad guys. Uh, and uh, that is often in a context of uh, writing history as the history basically of victims and the, the process of their victimization. Now, none of those uh, genre really uh, come naturally to me. Uh, and so I uh, was looking elsewhere. Though I have to say that in general, when I set out to write a, 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 book, a, a work of history, I don't think what genres is going to be in. Uh, but if you're told to write shortest history at 50,000 words, and it needs to cover 70 years plus an aftermath of collapse, plus uh, political, social, cultural, economic, diplomatic, military, uh, then you, you do get a bit self-conscious about how, how you're going to do it. Uh, now, if you going back to the question of genre, if you think um, that in Soviet history there's some non-black stuff that is worth taking notice of, uh, you might say the, the red aspect, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the less negative. Uh, there is another genre available, that is uh, the genre of pathos, noble ideals, doomed to failure. And I think in my very first book that Katrina referred to, uh, The Commissariat of Enlightenment, that was very much the genre there, that they come in with these wonderful ideas about enlightenment and encounter realities, including budgets and uh, bureaucratic politics and so on. And maybe in my Russian Revolution, which uh, incredibly is still going, although it was written in 1980, I think, Anyway, there's probably a bit of it uh, there too. And I suppose if one were writing about Gorbachev, one could write about pay in, 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 in the pathetic genre, in other words, noble ideals that, uh, that ended in disaster. Uh, but in shortest history, I was dealing with the totality of Soviet history, including the long Brezhnev period, the long, very much post-revolutionary Brezhnev period, for which noble ideas betrayed just seems irrelevant as, as an approach. Uh, and I did want the Brezhnev period not to be uh, <laughs> the boring thing uh, in, uh, in between, uh, uh, in between the, the high spots. So black comedy was my choice, or perhaps I should say simply the way I found I could write the book. Now, this choice puts me in a, a Russian-Soviet literary tradition, and I, I was aware of that. Uh, and it runs, at least as, as I understand it, it runs from the 19th century satirist uh, Siltikov Shidrin, uh, 
in his Historia Novo Gorda, the history of one, uh, one town, through Solzhenitsyn, Gulag Archipelago, I think is a very good example of black comedy, among other things. Uh, a, a tradition that presents a disaster uh, uh, through a lens of absurdity. Now, how I became acquainted with that tradition was, uh, is perhaps associated with the way I learned Soviet history. Because I, in fact, never took any classes in Soviet history because nobody was teaching it when I was, uh, uh, when I was at, the, at the appropriate uh, career uh, path. And so I went uh, on the exchange, the British exchange, to uh, the Soviet Union in 1966-67. Uh, and was appointed an awful official mentor uh, who wasn't any use to me, but found myself my own informal memoir uh, mentor, uh, Igor Alexandrovich Satz, who I write about extensively in Spy in the Archives. And so I spent many hours uh, listening to Satz tell me about uh, Soviet history, and he basically told it as a Jewish joke. That was his genre. Of, it was a wonderful raconteur. Uh, and... Uh, that's the way I learned it. Uh, I also, I have to say, it was Satz who gave me my copy of Saltik of Shadrin's Historia ad Novo uh, And I think well, possibly it was at Satz's place that I read a lot of Solzhenitsyn. I think I probably already, no, no, Gulag wasn't out yet. Yeah, Gulag came out only in 70. So, right, it, it wasn't. But I, I made my first acquaintance with Solzhenitsyn's uh, manuscript there, and this was in part because Sartre was an editor on Novi Mir, the, uh, the, the, the critically minded but not dissident uh, journal sort of walking the narrow path uh, in the uh, 60s and, oh, well, the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and Novi Mir itself uh, was uh, a noted practitioner, or it's, it's many of its authors, like uh, Vladimir Lakshin, were notably book practitioners of, um, of a sarcastic polemical style, which can also be associated with black comedy. Those of you who've read Novi Mir may remember the very long articles which in detail go after some target, like Marietta Shanginyan, and simply demolish that target by detail after detail after detail, uh, each one adding to a sense of uh, total absurdity uh, but this not being stated, it's, it's the reader who, 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 who draws this uh, conclusion. So I read a lot of uh, Novi Mir in those years, and that was clearly uh, formative in terms of my approach too. But I think everybody uh, who was there around that time probably was exposed to, to the black comedy uh, approach, uh, uh, approach to Soviet life, of course, rather than Soviet history. Uh, there was a, the journal Krakadil, though that was that was official uh, uh, satire. There was the, there was Ar Armenian radio, the the, the, uh, the the imaginary locus source of many jokes. Uh, there was the, the 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 political joke, the anecdote, uh, which everybody told, uh, and one almost had to learn to tell them oneself, which is difficult in a language not your own. Uh, there, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov's work were being, was being republished, Andrei Platonov. Uh, then with the next generation, you go into Vainovich, that's a little bit later. Uh, so those are antecedents. If I were to look uh, closer uh, to the present, uh, I might, uh, for a black comedy reading of a part of Soviet history, I might point to Amanda Yanucci's 2017 film, Death of Stalin. Now, that film, some people hate it. I, I liked it. I thought it was very funny. I also thought it was so like, in, so close in spirit uh, to chapter eight of my, uh, my book on Stalin's team. This is my Politburo book, The Years of Living Dangerously in Soviet Politics, uh, that I wondered if he'd drawn on it. Now, I've, I've since found that he, uh, well, it's conceivable he did, but actually he's, his main source uh, turns out to be uh, uh, a French graphic novel uh, by Fabien Nury called La, La Mort de Staline, uh, which came out uh, 2010, that is before my own Stalin's team. However, it was a nice thought. Uh, and it's, 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 it was a rare occasion when you, 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 you encounter something in, 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 a, in, a, in a, an artistic field, not your own, 
and it seems, and you recognize it. You, you, you recognize it as, as close, very close to the way you, you have tried uh, to present something in your own uh, field. So I've made uh, this claim that at any rate for me, there is something about Soviet history specifically uh, that produces uh, the urge to write it in terms of black comedy. So what might that be? Uh, what is it about Soviet system uh, or Soviet life? It, it's curious that one uses that term system about the Soviets and we don't really talk about our own, we don't talk about a Western system, do we? In any case, system is, is, a, is a word with, it, with its own, uh, 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 with lots to be said about it, but I won't say anything about it. Now, uh, I'll start off by looking at, uh, looking in the realm of theory, uh, theory about how the Soviet Union operated. Uh, and here, of course, one has to turn to the, to the ideology. This is a state with an explicit ideology of Marxism-Leninism, and it contained within this ideology are several uh, aspects, several features, very promising uh, for black comedy. Uh, the first is zakonomirnost. Uh, that is the notion of uh, that there are laws of history that things happen predictably uh, uh, according to a, a linear equation, uh, and that these laws can be known, and that therefore there is uh, uh, one can one can confidently uh, foretell uh, the future. Uh, now. This economist, this, 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 uh, these laws of history were taught in all the political literacy uh, classes, uh, and so everybody knew about it. But in fact, everybody also knew that everything in the Soviet Union occurred through China, and through China was their word for accidentally. Uh, uh, and it, it, it was often said of something that shouldn't have happened that it happened accidentally. In other words, it happened not according to the plan, not according to prediction. Therefore, its status as, as an event is a little dubious because it was just an accidental thing, not a truly significant thing. Uh, but so many accidental things uh, tend to add up to uh, significance. Uh, now, starting with, uh, if one gets into more specifics, starting with the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, uh, you can see a lot of, uh, of iterations of the uh, that, um, uh, that produce some nice results in black comedy terms. For example, uh, the mental contortions involved in the Bolsheviks making a revolution, launching a revolution, when their theory said it was only the revolution after next that was legitimately theirs. In other words, in terms of Marxist analysis, Russia was due for a bourgeois revolution. Uh, they were on the next revolution, the proletarian revolution, so they had no right to make a revolution, but they did it anyway. Now, uh, next to as uh, economist comes dialectica, dialectics. Uh, this is uh, also taught in all the political was taught in all the politi political literacy. Uh, classes, and there are wonderful comic possibilities of the premise that everything can be or become its opposite. Uh, the, the joke that encapsulates uh, uh, these possibilities uh, runs approximately, socialism is the end of exploitation of man by man, and its replacement by its opposite. So that gives you a, <laughs> gives you a sense of where you can go with dialectics. Uh, I think the uh, understanding of the relationship of the capitalist West also had great po comic potential. Uh, there's, on the one hand, a superiority claim, Hushoff's, we, we will bury you because history is on our side, uh, implying leadership of, of the progressive cause throughout the world. But at the same time, tremendous emphasis on the fact that we have to catch up and overtake you. So simultaneously in a position of superiority and, and in a position of inferiority and backwardness. Uh, then think about literary theory, the theory of socialist realism. Socialist realism basically, uh, it, it, it's a, it was an attempted prescription for how, how to write literature that was useful uh, in Soviet circumstances. And what was recommended here is an understanding that what you see in the real world, the naturalistic kind of uh, uh, realism, is uh, in a way misleading. What you need to see, you need to have the ability to look through uh, that um, that actually in, in being uh, situation and see the lineaments of the future through it. Uh, in other words, you, you look at, uh, at, at a vacant lot uh, full of rubbish 
And because you know there is such a plan, you say next year there will be a park, a park for the people. Uh, so th this is the basic of, a basis of socialist realism, and, and you can see its comic uh, potential too. Uh, I think also on nationality, the ideology on nationality uh, needs to be mentioned here, nationality and empire. You had, uh, uh, the Bolsheviks were anti-imperial. They saw themselves as, as creating something uh, very different from an empire, but on the other hand, they did it in the, uh, in the lands that had been an empire. Uh, but I think one of the, 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 the most intriguing aspects uh, is that they are, uh, their, is their attitude to, na to, to nationalism. Uh, they regarded this as false consciousness uh, because class was the real identifier. At the same time, they thought uh, that recent history showed there was no avoiding it, and therefore you had to give in to this false consciousness, and therefore you had to create national republics. That would be the, the, uh, the only viable uh, form, despite the fact uh, that uh, you, you know it's class and not nationality that matters. So that's, uh, that's theory. Uh, what about practice, which I generally prefer to talk about? Uh, like a person given to malapropisms, the Soviet Union frequently generated situations for which the exclamation anecdote uh, seemed the only appropriate response. A few quick examples, and I'll take one from Yanucci, which is also from my chapter eight in, on, on Stalin's team. Uh, the circumstances of, of, of Stalin's death uh, with the dictator lying unconscious, the, his close associates, the Politburo gathered, uh, the family summoned. But there are problems about finding a doctor because most of the Kremlin doctors who normally treated Stalin had recently been arrested in uh, the, uh, the doctor's plot, uh, uh, trumped up ac accusations against doctors of, uh, of being uh, traitors and, and, and murderers. Uh, in uh, the... the uh, at the uh, end of, uh, the, of, of, of perestroika, the Gorbachev period, uh, you had the uh, uh, attempted coup in August, uh, 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 the attempted coup from the right uh, that ended in total confusion of the plotters, and Yeltsin, if you remember, Stan Yeltsin, <laughs> who was not meant to be part of this story, uh, of the Gorbachev story, standing on a tank uh, representing democracy and Gorbachev flying back unharmed uh, from uh, from his summer vacation. Now, a uh, uh, final example that one might give, it's the Soviet Union's final collapse, the very end, the end game in December uh, 1991, uh, which comes following a Russian initiative. So the, the empire is dismantled uh, as a, uh, in... Uh, in immediate response to a Russian initiative, that is when the Russian Republic's newly elected president, Boris Yeltsin, after a secret meeting in December 1991 of the presidents of Ukraine and Belarusia, led the three Slavic republics out of the Union, leaving Gorbachev president of nothing. And that was, that was the end. So let me now turn uh, to discussing uh, necessity in history, back to Zakonomirnost. Uh, I keep saying Zakonomirnost because there isn't any good uh, English translation. I think uh, in German, Gesetzmäßigkeit, but we just don't have one. Uh, now, I invoked Soviet belief in this in historical Zakonomirnost at the head of my list of Soviet ideological factors tending to produce uh, black comedy outcomes. But now I would like to address the issue seriously in non-comedic terms as one of substantial importance to historians. Now, according uh, to Marx's notion of the laws of history, uh, there is a necessary sequence of stages. Uh, uh, feudalism leads to capitalism, leads to socialism, that enables not only understanding of the past, but foreknowledge of the future. Now, uh, Marxists are not the Marxists know that they have embraced this notion, uh, but uh, they are by no means the only ones. I think many people operate with an informal uh, sense of inevitability uh, that they are, are, are really not quite aware of, and that applies to historians and uh, all the more uh, to ordinary people. I think people particularly are inclined to think 
that if, if there's a really big event, uh, like, let's say, the October Revolution, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, there must be a kind of inevitability about it. It's so big that it, it must have had to happen uh, because of, 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 of big underlying causes. Uh, now, at the same time, most historians will deny that they have any ability to predict, uh, and that implies that they don't think that there are laws of history or linear equations in history. But historical explanation has a built-in tendency to reinforce the sense of inevitability. In other words, I set out uh, a convincing argument of why such and such a thing happened, and the very, in the very terms of my argument, uh, there is a, an implication which I, I may not uh, 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 intend, but which is there nevertheless, uh, that not only is this how things happened, not only am I making sense of how things happened, I'm, I'm showing how that they had to happen this way. The more authoritative the style, the more persuasive the argument, uh, the greater the reinforcement of the sense of inevitability, and this can be a trap. Now, there are various ways uh, to out of this, uh, and I won't go into all of them, but uh, one, uh, one way, one alternative way of thinking uh, uh, to help avoid a sense of, uh, of inevitability, I think, is to think of history as a chaotic system uh, in the, the, uh, the, science, the physical sciences sense that is chaotic, not random, not uh, chaotic meaning that there are patterns in history, there are regularities uh, that prevail for, um, for a certain time, uh, but they're not permanent and uh, they don't uh, make possible prediction. Thus, once one can show the sequence that led up to an outcome, uh, but nevertheless, the outcome couldn't have been predicted in advance. And uh, following from chaos theory uh, is uh, the recognition that big events actually don't need to have commensurably big causes, big in unavoidable causes. Small things in chaos, history, in chaos theory may set off big events, the famous butterfly's wing. Uh, and uh, so big events like revolutions and state collapses are no more, therefore, uh, inevitable or predictable than, than small events like, I don't know, whether, whether you meet a future partner at a party or, or whatever. Uh, these big events didn't have to happen any more than the small events did, uh, even though in the aftermath, uh, many, including historical interpreters, will develop a stake in conveying that they did have to happen. Uh, things, in fact, uh, could have gone otherwise. I'll turn now uh, to the question of surprise in history. As is evident from what I've said so far, I believe that history can and does produce real surprises, although it is generally not in the historian's interest uh, as authoritative explainers to stress this, uh, this fact. This is a point I'm happy to make in principle, but was particularly pleased to have the chance of demonstrating in practice with shortest history. This is a book that starts with an unpredictable and unpredicted seizure of political power in November or October, whichever uh, calendar you prefer, 1917, that even more unpredictably held. Uh, to produce the Soviet Union, uh, and it's a book that ends with an equally unpredictable and unpredicted collapse of the Soviet state, uh, which the country's formidable military and security structure totally failed to prevent or halt. I'll come to that collapse at the end of the, my talk, uh, but first I'll take another example from Soviet history, uh, the political consequences of Stalin's death. Uh, to uh, illustrate uh, both surprise and the difficulty that people have of accommodating and finding a way of understanding things that are surprising. For all my admiration for Yanucci, he didn't get everything right about the aftermath of Stalin's death, uh, which occurred in March 1953. Uh, if you remember, we have these terrible bumblers who are, 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 are milling around, 
uh, with no particular idea of what to do. And uh, certainly there is no sense that anything coherent is going to emerge out of that milling around. Uh, it's, 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 it's a comic moment uh, that doesn't have, uh, as it were, a, a serious follow-up. What he missed, along with most contemporary observers and subsequent historians, was that those bumblers produced a thoroughgoing reform program immediately launched after Stalin's death. Uh, the, the bumblers uh, were the so-called collective leadership. Uh, that means they were Stalin's Politburo without Stalin uh, that took over uh, when he died. Uh, and uh, I think this episode has been widely misunderstood because it is so counterintuitive what happened. You would expect, uh, this, is a, um, this is a group of people, the Stalin's Politburo, who had worked with Stalin in uh, a subordinate capacity, for, mainly for decades. Uh, he was the, the big boss in the Politburo. Uh, they were the, uh, the people that he, uh, on the surface, uh, kicked around. Now, he also used them. They had, they had their special uh, responsibilities for different areas, but nevertheless, uh, party hacks is the way they are normally described in the literature. I'm talking if uh, Molotov is one of them, Vardashilov, uh, Mikoyan, Beria, the, the security man, uh, Hushov, but he was a junior member of the group at this point. Uh, now, although uh, party hacks, though they were, uh, and certainly kicked around by Stalin and spoken to often with contempt, uh, one might note uh, that he met with them almost daily over decades for, for a couple of hours. Now, that suggests that they're playing a function somewhat more than simply to be uh, kicked around. But, uh, however, that, of course, was not... That became known to us only, only fairly re when the archives opened and Stalin's... Um, the, 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 the journals, the, the... What do you call it? The, the protocols of his day, his diary not his personal diary, but, but his official diary, uh, became available and we saw how he spent his time. So here, so these are people uh, subject to Stalin's bullying, uh, had their hands slapped when they over, overstepped shifting lines. Uh, in the last months of Stalin's uh, life, he had turned against several of them and their political survival uh, looked dubious, so they were on top of everything really scared. Uh, they were under too much security surveillance to risk <laughs> to risk talking to plotting with each other, uh, and, and there is no, uh, in other words, advanced discussion of what might happen when the old man died. As far as one can see, uh, this didn't occur. Uh, now, what did people expect to happen after Stalin died? Uh, the Western version was that the Soviet Union was a totalitarian regime. Uh, which was dependent, like Nazi Germany, on a charismatic leader for survival, uh, lacked any capacity for adaptation to new circumstances or any procedure for choosing a successor. So when Stalin died, uh, this theory went, there was a good chance the whole thing would self-destruct. Uh, and I think it, it's very hard to say what ordinary Russians or ordinary Soviet citizens in the Stalin period thought, uh, but I think many of them uh, felt apprehensive that when Stalin, the towering figure, died, uh, there would be some kind of time of troubles. So what actually happened? The surviving, the Politburo members, when they were not at Stalin's bedside, uh, they were in his office. Uh, he took a while to die. They were in his office uh, in the Kremlin. And what were they doing? Uh, they were deciding, they were appointing the ministers for the new government that would, uh, would be announced on his death. Uh, of course, they were appointing themselves, but they were sharing out the portfolios. Uh, so they had the, po the, the, the post-death uh, announcement ready, uh, and they had the personnel of the new, what was to be called a collective uh, uh, leadership, uh, 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 all, uh, all organized. Uh, now, that concept of a collective leadership, which was new, uh, to many Western observers, and didn't seem very interesting probably to Soviet ones, uh, that actually, if one looks closely at, at the way the Stalinist Politburo uh, operate, one can see uh, one can see elements of it. Uh, in other words, uh, just to refer back to the fact that this group met uh, more or less every day 
uh, year after year. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, and uh, discussed uh, matters of state uh, so that uh, there was, there was an element, there's, there's a, dict a personal dictatorship, but it has an element of, uh, of at least potential collective leadership uh, uh, underneath it. And uh, that, uh, the potential, was very dramatically uh, evidenced when Stalin died, when uh, this bunch of Stalinist hacks and bumblers uh, launched into a, a really thoroughgoing reform program, really thoroughgoing. Uh, first thing they did was call off the anti-Semitic campaign, stopped it in its track. Well, they couldn't stop it in its track, but officially uh, uh, called, that was within weeks. Uh, decided to reduce the numbers of people in gulag in, in, the, in the labor camp system dramatically. Uh, uh, changed course very significantly in the question of Russian presence in the non-Russian republics. Uh, basically, with the uh, in, 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 with the aim of indigenization uh, of, uh, in, in other words, so that Latvians would have more part in running the Latvian uh, Soviet Republic. That was done uh, tremendously fast in in uh, Latvia. In fact, there was uh, a bit of um, pushback uh, from from the, the existing Latvian leadership, uh, uh, which which said, "But we don't have enough Latvians who are not on the blacklist." to a point, uh, and uh, the, the answer came, appoint them anyway. Uh, so this is, I mean, really dramatic, as, as was evident from when the archives opened, uh, but not before. There were really significant approaches to the West, attempting rapprochement. This is not prominent in the history books because the West didn't uh, really accept, they based, uh, the US in particular uh, ignored them, uh, they, uh, thinking <laughs> this, can't, this can't be true. Uh, there were major concessions to urban consumers, in other words, attempt to Im Im improve the supply of consumer goods. Uh, and that was an important, a really important change of policy because previously the investment was going to heavy industry. Uh, and there was a reduction of crippling tax burden on peasants. So, okay, that's quite a long list of radical reform and we're talking here the first three months. In addition, in that period, Stalin's name, formerly ubiquitous in the press, disappeared entirely from the newspapers. I don't know why that is not more prominent in the accounts, uh, uh, in the yeah. historical accounts, but anyone who wants to look up Pravda in his list, you will find it so. Uh, so, West didn't take seriously uh, 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 these uh, approaches, as I've said, because of the feeling that um, they couldn't be happening, uh, and uh, the detente overtures were ignored. Uh, but the internal reforms uh, didn't uh, encounter the same kind of stumbling blocks and uh, made uh, a very rapid and considerable uh, impact. Now, we associate reform with Khrushchev and several, uh, three years, uh, yes, three years uh, down the road, 1956 Khrushchev. And indeed, that is a new, that is an extension of the reforms, but uh, he, he was building on, the, on the, the very significant reform package introduced uh, by uh, the, the group of which he was uh, initially a, a junior uh, colleague. And it is all the more remarkable because as I've said, it's, it's very hard to see how they could have, how they coordinated in advance. Uh, 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 such a coherent policy would appear to have been coordinated in advance, doesn't seem to have been. So let me now go uh, to the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, which I take as, uh, as a good example of a surprise. It surprised, uh, it surprised, it seems, uh, as, uh, according to my memory, virtually everybody at the time, uh, both internally in the Soviet Union and uh, externally. Uh, nobody would have thought, let's say in, uh, uh, well, it, 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 was the, it was the first in a series of surprises. A uh, few people would have predicted in 1985 that the solid communist Gorbachev, elected general secretary by, by, the, uh, by the Politburo, would launch a reform program uh, that would end up, for a, to take just a few uh, examples, uh, with the Soviet Union giving up Eastern Europe uh, without a quid pro quo from the West. I think anybody would have dismissed that as impossible. Uh, 
a, 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 an, an episode of glassness, in other words, throwing everything open for discussion uh, that uh, was incredibly exhilarating uh, for everybody taking part of it, part in it, but at the same time went so far that it was also shocking, I think. Went so far and was so un, untypical, uncharacteristic of what people were used to. Uh, then uh, 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 Perestroika, uh, that, which turned out not to be an economic reform program that never materialized, uh, but a political Perestroika that actually destroyed uh, the Communist Party. Uh, in other words, Gorbachev uh, destroyed his own power base. That was extremely counter, or participated in the destruction of his own power base. Uh, in uh, addition to these surprises, one had, if you were looking at regional and republican uh, level, it became evident, I think, as it had not been uh, to many observers, uh, especially Western ones, that the first secretaries, the communist bosses of uh, the regions and the republics, were extremely powerful within their own territories, though, of course, subject to be dismissed uh, from Moscow. Uh, it's so powerful, indeed, that they had their, the ability, as we saw in 1991, to take their republics out of the Soviet Union, to lead their republics uh, without, uh, in most cases, being forced to do this by popular pressure. Since all these things happened, it's natural to try to make it make sense in retrospect. For example, uh, by finding the fatal flaw in uh, the Soviet system or the late, uh, or the Brezhnevian system that led to inevitable collapse. Uh, and there are a lot of economic arguments that go from saying you had economic stagnation uh, uh, and then jumping basically uh, to, the no to, to the idea of state collapse. But there's actually a long way between economic state uh, uh, stagnation and state collapse. Uh, Another uh, way of looking at it, uh, immediately everybody started calling the Soviet Union an empire, which within the, the Soviet field had not, the Western Soviet field, had not been that, uh, the, um, the custom uh, before 91. But everybody started calling it an empire and uh, tending to write the story in terms of, uh, of oppressed colonial subjects overthrowing their uh, Russian oppressors. Now, this was the basis for the new national histories that the republics all had to write. Uh, it was more of a problem for the Russians, who tended to think that they had been subsidizing the peripheries rather than uh, uh, vice versa. Uh, but that is, so that story of, of, of colonial oppression, which finally is overthrown, it's a very plausible story, but, and, and which, whose whose appropriateness varies with the different republics that, you know, they're, they're, they're really all different stories. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's also one uh, that doesn't necessarily give us the full picture. So regardless of how we end up uh, telling the Soviet and Russian story, uh, that surprise of 1991 is too big to leave out. But when I was uh, thinking of, uh, how I'd present uh, the argument or the material in, in shortest history. Uh, I thought a lot <coughs> about how to make that surprise real for the reader. And because I, as I've already pointed out, it's in the nature of historical explanation uh, to make the reader feel now I understand why it had to happen. Uh, so if what you want to say is don't forget it was terribly surprising, uh, that that is a problem. So what I decided to do was to begin my story in 1980. Now, 1980 uh, is the Brezhnev period. Uh, it's, a, it's a time when the Soviet system seemed to most people inside and, for that matter, outside uh, as extremely boring, uh, but also stable. Now, uh, that, that notion is encapsulated, I think, in the title of Alexei Yurchak's book, Everything Was Forever until it was no more. Uh, so what, 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 what was the situation as perceived in 1980? Living standards, if you, if you take the long perspective, living standards were higher than they had ever been. Now, okay, 
you've got a disappointment with the rate of improvement. You've got the economic stagnation. But nevertheless, the fact is people were, were are living better than they had in the past. There were no upheavals. And that's not a minor claim with regard to Soviet history. If you think, you know, revolution, collectivization, Second World War, you know, it, 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 it does tend to go on and on. So no upheavals. No secession movements. No republics trying to leave. Uh, no major vis uh, visible political dissatisfaction. Now, you have a dissident group. Uh, you have dis dissident groups, uh, mainly intellectuals with strong ties to Western journalists. But within the society, lacking, I think, uh, you, especially in Russia proper, lacking an institutional base. In other words, they're not functioning as, uh, uh, as a direct politi political uh, threat to Communist Party rule. In 1980, uh, Soviet leaders are, uh, in fact, quite often congratulated themselves, or in, in the 70s up, up to 1980, on not having the terrible social problems that existed in the West, notably generational conflict, uh, race problems, uh, they're looking mainly at the US, and, and drugs. Uh, and uh, in fact, there was a line of commentary that I think is totally forgotten about how the United States might collapse, a Soviet line of commentary, because it had these terrible problems and, and clearly there, was, there were fatal flaws which uh, might uh, lead to um, cataclysmic outcomes. Uh, in the United States, not in the Soviet Union. Now, finally, Western Sovietologists, uh, and Western Sovietology, that was the study of the Cold War study of Sovietology, uh, who's uh, centered in the United States. And Sovietologists had long doubted the long term stability of the Soviet Union. Uh, there had been uh, a, a sense that, as it was an illegitimate regime are basically was the Cold War enemy. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a, a situation basically lacking legitimacy. And that meant that for a long time, the expectation was that it probably wouldn't last. All the more because you had the uh, identification uh, as a, of a similar regime to Nazi Germany. And after all that, after uh, uh, whatever, 12, 13 years, uh, that was gone. So that assumption uh, had be, was around for a long time after the, uh, after the revolution. And it was, uh, it was quite strongly supported by the Russian emigre community, uh, which also uh, didn't uh, have the sense uh, uh, that the Soviets were going to be around forever. And, and many of the first uh, Soviet historians uh, came from that community. Uh, however, uh, 1980 is just the time when Sovietologists decided, we have to admit, the Soviet Union is stable. It's a permanent feature of the landscape. It's going to be around forever, or for, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the, the book that made this argument uh, most clearly was uh, in 1980 was Severin Biala's uh, very good book, actually, Stalin's Successes, Leadership, Stability, and Change in the Soviet Union. Uh, but this wasn't just one, one Sovietologist analysis. There, uh, there was discussion uh, among the political scientists, basically a statement of consensus. Yes, we will now all agree uh, that, that the model we, we ought to be using is one of stability uh, rather than one of impermanence. Even the Cold War hawks uh, accepted uh, that premise. Now. Associated with that was the fact that the Library of Congress, which had the best, uh, the, the deposit library for the United States and probably one of the very best collections of uh, Soviet material in the world, the, the Library of Congress had long refused to have an entry for the Soviet Union in its card catalog. Uh, that was for the reason that, uh, 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 for Cold War reasons, and also I think specifically for reasons of uh, uh, pressure from emigre groups that putting it in the card catalog uh, which was at that point the major, that was the catalog. Uh, the card catalog would uh, uh, confer a legitimacy which was inappropriate. Uh, so you, you couldn't find in the card catalog, there was no entry for Soviet Union. Uh, the, 
and that's important because a lot of Soviet books uh, were entered under, uh, were not, not, uh, not clearly identifiable by author. Anyway, so no entry under Soviet Union. You had to look up a card, a series of cards called Russia 1923 on. Uh, that was what, uh, that, that was one of the pieces of local law that you learned uh, quickly uh, on becoming a Sovietologist. But around 1980, I unfortunately don't have the exact date, but it's around then, uh, Jim Billington, who was about to become the Librarian of Congress and was already associated with it, he started canvassing the opinion of Sovietologists as to whether it was time to abandon this stance. Uh, and actually create an entry for the Soviet Union. And this was by no means, he was no pro-Soviet um, dove, not at all, but he, simply a recognition of reality. Uh, so he asked all the Sovietologists, and that's why I know about it, because I was one of the people asked, and everyone said, of course, of course there should be a, an entry under the Soviet Union. It's an embarrassing uh, lacuna that there hasn't been. It seems self-evident. I think nobody, there was literally no objection. So, after almost 60 years of denial, the Soviet Union acquired its own entry in the Library of Congress's card catalog uh, on the grounds that was undeniably a permanent fixture in the world. Card catalogs, to be sure, would soon be on their way out. But the Soviet Union's demise came even quicker. In a master stroke of black comedy, scarcely more than a decade after finally being recognized by the Library of Congress as undeniably permanent, the Soviet Union had ceased to exist. Thank you. <laughs>